All right, we are continuing a study on finding God's will for your life. I've adapted this from a little book by J.R. Packer called Guidance and Wisdom. We want to um, understand the truths and the uh, fallacies about people seeking God's will. Uh, first of all, God is our guide. God is our guide. And um, so this much is, is true. This much uh, we agree with, the idea of following that. So uh, what we dealt with last time is God can and does guide. God has a plan for individuals, and God can communicate his plan for us. We've seen that throughout the scripture in, in many different ways. But um, today his plan is for us to read what he gave us in the word of God. And uh, he has his spirit living within us. The spirit was the one who inspired. It was God-breathed, God-spirited. And so uh, we have the very author of the Bible within us that we can be led to understand. All right, now we're looking at seeking divine guidance. And uh, in this, we want to ask some specific questions. First of all, Believers often seek God's guidance in a wrong way. And uh, how, you say, is that wrong way? Well, they distort the nature of God's will and the method of divine guidance. They think of guidance as essentially an inward prompting of the Holy Spirit apart from the Word of God. You hear this, uh, good preachers <laughs> lead people astray in this uh, I just felt God to do this. I just felt God to do this. And see, my question on these things, and very often the preacher is saying, God has led me to build this building out here, so we need the money, and you know, let's obey the leading of God. And the question I have is, how did you know if that was God or just your desire? Where was the thing that made it clear that it was God? See, the, the thing that I want to be able to do is to say, I feel God's leading. I did that today, I was talking to a young man, and I said, I am not a prophet, I do not have a revelation from God in this thing, but a need was expressed, and as I thought about that, you came to my mind. And uh, so I put him in contact with the people to see if this might be a match made in heaven, and uh, they may, he might be able to be a, a helper to these folks. But um, that was very plainly not something from the Word of God. I was trying to make that clear to him, that I was not speaking for God in this. I was just suggesting that he, looks, he seems to me to be a good fit. Um, don't think that you have to wait to be led by your heart. What did Jeremiah tell us about the heart? <laughs> it is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. This is not the one you want leading you. It will fool you. It will take you in wrong places. So this is a seedbed of fanaticism and folly um, that uh, you, you start doing things out of randomness, uh, just counting on God to, to lead you. Then the common mistake in terminology. When they hear... God's will, they think of only a certain class of guidance. J.I. Packer in his book <clears throat> gives this a name. He calls it vocational choices. Now vocational we often use about our job and so on, but vocational means a calling, some sort of a calling, see? <clears throat> so what are vocational choices? Well these are choices between competing options all of which appear lawful and good. So then we say, well, uh, all of these are equally God-honoring uh, and so on. Maybe other things are equally good. What I would be telling people is that if, uh, if you will not have to compromise your uh, Christian testimony to do one or the other, and both of them are in themselves, you know, you're not selling illegal drugs, you're, you're they're, God-honoring jobs, then, uh, you know, just go to work and decide which one um, 
would be best, see. Uh, uh, you make that decision because it's, all of that is well within the will of God. So uh, what they're asking, you know, the, the young, young people especially, vocational choices are, should I get married? Who should I marry? Should we have more than one child? How many children should we have? Which church should I join? Which profession should I pursue? Should I serve God in this land or abroad? And so, uh, you know, how many children does the Bible say that we ought to have? <laughs> well, it gives us a picture of um, the children are like arrows, and he says, happy is the man who has a quiver full of them. So you go checking quivers and see how many uh, arrows are in there, and you get an idea of what God wants to do. So let's um, consider this two features of vocational choices. First of all, they cannot be resolved by a direct application of biblical teaching. If I say, you know, so Olivia says, I'm not sure if I should marry this guy. Well, what, no, what, no. <laughs> what Bible verse? No. <laughs> Grandma says no. <laughs> uh, uh, that's a different, different kind of vocational choice. Uh, but what, what book of the Bible, what verse of the Bible will I go to to find out who, who Olivia should marry? See? Uh, you can't do that. That's, that's not the way that works. So um, that leaves me with point B. They must be resolved by God-given prompting that draws us to make a decision. This is where you can begin to rely on the inner prompting. Uh, to, uh, perhaps the inner uh, prompting is, is basically our intuition. In other words, you're, you have a perceptive mind that takes everything in. I've read uh, indications of, of billions of bits of information you are receiving every second. Every sense that you have, and even the ones that you don't recognize very much, uh, are bringing all that in. So you're perceiving far more than you can use, and the perceptive mind basically filters it out. Its, its job is to interpret what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're feeling. And that's why when we look at a cloud, we say, oh, look, it looks like a pig or a dragon or something, you know, uh, because the perceptive mind is always trying to answer the riddle, what is it? What am I seeing? What is it? What, what, make it familiar. Then the decisive mind, the cognitive mind, the thinking mind, takes the information that is deemed important and forms a plan by it. However, <clears throat> from time to time, the conscious mind uh, says, well, I don't have enough information. If you, if you ask yourself, imagine that I do have that information. Uh, what, uh, what would be the best choice if I just think about this? Then it, it automatically goes back to the perceptive mind and filters through billions of bits of information and you come up with a sense of, did I whistle? Uh, a sense of, it really whistled in my <laughs> hearing aid. Um, the, uh, you come up with a sense of, the, of what, what uh, you feel should be right and that's probably pretty good as long as you've already determined that none of these are bad. Two mistakes that are often made. <clears throat> One is all guidance questions have these same characteristics. Well, that's a mistake. Uh, in different situations, different, uh, uh, different people, different uh, choices uh, are all different. And the second mistake is that all life should be treated as vocational choices. Well, that's not, not true. There's a lot of choices that actually are limited by the Word of God. So how do we correct the mistake? Well, first of all, the fundamental method of finding God's guidance uses rational understanding and rational application of His Word. Um, a man was told to find a verse in the Bible that proved that he was supposed to marry this girl. 
And he said, no, that's not possible. <laughs> that's, that's not the way the word of God works. This is not a spin the thing and get a divination thing. Um, so rational understanding of his word is not like, uh, oh, I found a verse that said Olivia, so. <laughs> Can't think of one, actually, on top of my head. But. Um, so what does this do this, to correcting it? Well, this limits the area in which vocational guidance is needed and given. Um, so do we, does the word of God speak any wisdom in this? Do uh, any of these choices, as I mentioned, one of the things that I found personally um, that led me uh, to make, to, to, for me to choose one thing or the other was um, if one of them would tend to make me compromise my stand, my faith, my uh, witnessing that uh, working there would limit my Christian testimony. And if it did, then it, it had a dark mark on it, see. <clears throat> and uh, the one that didn't was then preferable. So this limits the area in which vocational guidance is needed and given. And secondly, only those who have become attuned to this are likely to recognize true vocational guidance when it comes. You have to be ready to look at the word of God on the basis of how does it urge me to think and live and speak. Uh, if you're just waiting for Bible stories, it's, it's not gonna help you much. You have to get into especially the epistles of the New Testament where he's over and over again correcting problems in the churches. And there you'll find uh, the very thing that you're looking for. Uh, but you have to be attuned to that. You have to be looking for that. You have to be asking that question. So the fundamental method is rational understanding and rational application of his word. Secondly, God honoring guidance comes from honoring his holy scriptures. And this is where you make much of that. You make much of the, um, the word of God. <clears throat> you say, I want to be led by that word. So number one, this instills basic convictions, things that I do be, you know, if you have a conviction, you have a conviction because the Bible says this, you believe it and you're not gonna, you're not gonna change it, see. Um, you don't have a conviction if you're not sure where that comes from. That's just maybe prejudice or there's something else. But it instills basic convictions, attitudes, ideals, and value judgments. You get that from, uh, the, by uh, attuning yourself to the scriptures. You think about that, value judgments, um, ideals. What What is the ideal? The uh, Word of God tells us that the great goal for the Christians growing up in, in Christ is discernment. That, um, you know, when, when you say, uh, I noticed you were doing that, and they say, well, what's wrong with it? It's actually the wrong question. Uh, I mean, it, it's a pretty good question. If you do know something that's wrong with it, you can say, well, the Bible says, don't do that. However, our question isn't I'm going to do anything that the Bible says uh, that doesn't say the Bible uh, that anything wrong with it. Well, there are a lot of things that you could do, but what is the best? Discernment says I'm going to restrict my choices to the things that are best, not just average, not just good, just okay. Um, not me, eh, good enough. That's not, that's not what we're looking for. We're trying to sift through our lives and find the things that are the best. Now, you have to understand best from the very love of God because he's, uh, God's love directs him, God is love, it directs him to seek the best for us. And you will seek 
the best for those that you love and, um, and encourage them. But you will seek the best for the ones you love by the choices you make as well. All right, then secondly, this shapes our lives by a constant pressure on us to conform to the image of Christ. At a time when you're saying, I don't know about ideals, I don't know about this, well, go to the life of Christ. Go back to the Gospels. Read through this and see this situation came up. How did Christ think about it? How did he act on it? You see? And as you do that, you... Uh, the idea, let, me, let me give you a little secret about being conformed to the image of Christ. Um, God has made our mind in, in this interesting way that if we focus on a goal, if, if we focus on that as our goal, then automatically we begin to make choices toward that goal. Somebody said, well, what I did to lose weight is I put a picture of an ugly old fat person up on the refrigerator so that it would scare me away every time I went in to get a snack. And so they asked, well, how's that working for you? He said, well, not very well. <laughs> uh, and the, the true goal would be to get uh, you know, the body of somebody that looked like you'd like to look and put your head on it and put that on the refrigerator. And as you go there, you have this positive example and you automatically begin to focus in that regard. Uh, different people have in, you know, reinvented this all along, the, the secret and all these other things. You are you're after it. Uh, my dad had a book, uh, Think and Grow Rich, back when his uh, goal in life was to be a millionaire. And um, uh, <laughs> I was reading it uh, after I've fairly grown and, and uh, I said, well, I understand this guy. Uh, that is his, uh, that's his goal of heaven. And he wants every day, he wants you to have your devotions. He said, stand up, look in the mirror and say, I want to be rich. I want to be rich. I want to be rich. And then put beside the mirror the verse that says, those who desire to be rich fall into many snares. Um, that the desire to be rich is uh, the uh, essence of all sin. So... Um, no, we, uh, but the idea of having a goal and focusing upon it, and this is what the scripture tells us, that uh, as we meditate on Christ, just focus on him. You've, you remember the story, Nathaniel Hawthorne, the great stone face? I've told us, okay. Um, the, basically, a young man lived in a New England town, and uh, up on the mountain, from their village, there was a side of this there that had a, a craggy face, and it looked strong and it looked powerful. And they had a little legend in there that one day a man would come to their village that would have that face and he would be a great leader. And uh, there was a little boy that said, I wonder if he's here. And he started looking around and he said, well, wait a minute, I don't even, I couldn't recognize him if I had looked at him. So he started spending part of his day gazing at that face and trying to imagine what that firm brow indicated as a character and that that nose that seemed to be not too long not too short but uh, but strong and and uh, prominent and he just began to to think of what that face uh, would be like he got his man size on him and began to look more like a man and people began to say, hey, look at him, hey, look at him. And it turns out that uh, he was the one that as he had spent the time looking at the great stone face that it became him. And I think that's his parable about uh, looking at Christ and uh, becoming conformed to his image. It is not so much an analytical thing as it is uh, just drinking in the life of Christ and you automatically begin, begin to make choices, begin to make uh, attitude changes that will move you into that image once you understand the image. All right, number six, the basic form of divine guidance. What is that? God presents to us 
the positive ideals that are guidelines for all our living. These are the commandments. These are the testimonies. It's, um, what is it, Psalm 9 or 19? It's Psalm 19, where he says that the word of God is this and this and this. And he talks about the testimonies, which are uh, primarily the idea of looking at the Old Testament people and seeing what they did and how their lives turned out. Those are the testimonies. So they, they uh, make it clear to the people that are having trouble with it. But God's commands are very clear, and so we, we do that. Then we look at the testimonies and see about that. And he talks about the various parts of Scripture and their, their purposes and their goals. Then the character of Jesus, the examples of godly people, and the consequences of sin become a pattern of life. Hopefully our pattern. This is uh, Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now this is an equation that, that once you become a child of God, then you are open to being led by the Spirit of God. Being led by the Spirit of God is one of the proofs that you are a son of God. So this demands a mortifying of known sin. You cannot have your pet sin that you keep in your private closet and go to when nobody's looking. You can't do that and be led of the Spirit. See, that's being led of the flesh. So uh, Romans 8, 13, just before 14, I'm giving it to you later. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. Deeds of the body here are the, the deeds that are trying to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And then let me close with the limits of inward guidance. There is that, but what are the limits? God never prompts us contrary to his word. Uh, read of uh, preachers going bad. You know, one man was... Um, actually uh, writing to the underage girl and said, God has planned for us to be together. And this was, he was a married man, you know, and she was underage. And, um, and he was actually planning to come and take her away and run away and grow up together, so to speak. And, uh, you know, there was nothing about God's will being honored there. Nothing. Uh, God never prompts us contrary to his word. That would be a a strange division of darkness in God. And then many other things than God's Spirit may prompt people. You may get a prompting, but where did that come from? This is how the devil works. When uh, in, in the early church, when they had this supernatural miracles still being done, the Word of God wasn't completed, they had the gift of prophecy. They had the gift of uh, speaking in tongues. Well, the gift of prophecy, the person would say, uh, I have a message from God. He says, please stand and tell us that. And so he would give it. Well, if somebody said, that can't be from God because the Bible says this or the Bible says that, or Jesus said that and Paul said that. That's why he said, try the spirits to see, to put them to the test to see if they be from God. How would you do that? You check it with the word of God. And uh, so ask yourself sometime, where did that thought come from? Where did that, how did that pop into my head? See? And you're asking basically, is this the Holy Spirit urging me? So if, if you say, I ought to write them a thank you note, that probably didn't come from the devil. It's not, you're not going to find a verse that tells you to do that. But uh, giving thanks in all things, maybe that would be a good concept, but... You know, the idea of expressing your praise and thanks for what people have done. Um, that, I, I take those things as from God. Uh, but uh, I think I, I ought to buy a pecan pie. Well, I know where that came from. And that was not God. That was not God. So um, I, uh, I think we can understand this concept that God is going to help us learn his will, but that is primarily through the word of God. Comments or questions?